we could actually just go home right now, and I know for me, I would have already received the blessing. I just praise the Lord for the, for the gift of hearing and the gift of musical talents and of singing. That was an awesome worship, and I just praise the Lord. Well, this week, I checked in my diary, which I do from day to day. Sometimes not every day, but normally most days I check in my diary what, what's happened, or I sit there and write in what I've done during the day. And there was something that was a bit scary to me. I don't know if any of you are realising the dates. What, what, what month are we in at the moment? So which means what's just around the corner? Oh, I hear some enthusiasm already. Excellent. Christmas. Why is Christmas so good? Oh, holiday. That's right. Who here plans to have a holiday this Christmas? Excellent. We don't even have some working class and they're having holidays, I guess, from school. Yes, it's something to look forward to, isn't it? I guess we can all say that we enjoy holidays, do we? Amen. But what's the trouble when a holiday is end? What's, what do we always say? Everyone says the same thing. The holiday wasn't what? Long enough. Long enough. That's right. This morning, could I interest anyone if I said I had an all expenses paid holiday? Do I have any takers? Oh, two over here. Yes, yes, his hands going up everywhere. Everyone's suddenly realizing all expenses paid. I guess you'd probably want to know how long. Are we going for? How many of us can go? And will we need to take anything or will everything be supplied? But I guess the most important question is, where are we going? Now if I said to you, Australia, you'd instantly get thoughts in your mind, wouldn't you? It probably wouldn't be the middle of the Simpson Desert. That probably wouldn't be a really good place for a holiday. But what if I said, near water? I don't know if any of you are here for Sabbath school, and, and during our Sabbath school video, there was a picture of, in Fiji of a beach, and there was white, beautiful sand with water lapping on it. That conjures up in your mind, doesn't it? But if I just said water, and I'll give you, give you where you're going, just by some GPS coordinates, 16 degrees south, 40 minutes and 50 seconds, by 138 degrees east, 20 minutes and one second. Would that be very helpful? I know where it is. It's because I checked on the map. Okay. It is called a place called Tully Inlet. Now, Tully Inlet sounds nice, doesn't it? It's guaranteed it's by the water. It's, on, in fact, on the estuary of Gold Creek. Sounding nice? Still not sure? Okay, you like to have a holiday and you want a bit of isolation. This place is definitely isolated. You're looking at the open ocean on a nice sheltered part of the coastline in Australia. The nearest inhabitants are only 100 kilometres away, called Woolagarang Station. The trouble is that 100 kilometres will probably take you, depending on the conditions, three to five hours to get there. And, still excited to go on this holiday? Because the next, the next real place that you can actually buy anything at all is from a place which is another 60 kilometres down the main highway, which can take you two to four hours to get there. It's called Hell's Gate. Literally, Hell's Gate Roadhouse. Oh, and by the way, you'll be sitting on the edge of your water, but when you get there, you have to sit there and wait for a tide change because it's not like here where the tide just comes up and goes down. High tide is 30 to 40 feet different from low tide. So when the tide's in, you'll be sitting at the water, and when it's low tide, the water's way out there. And if you go at the moment, October to May, sorry, you advise not to swim because of the box jellyfish. Oh, not to mention, um, it pays not to actually go, near the, go into the water because it's renowned for having sharks. Oh, and the last thing is um, when you want to go fishing, because most people want to go on holiday and have a bit of a fish if it's by water, don't go within four metres of the water at all because of the crocodiles. Still excited to go? It changes things, doesn't it? If we don't have a picture, we're not really sure what we, where we're going. If I asked the children this morning, and there's a few here, and they're all keen, if I said, we're going to go to Australia for holiday, 
Do you have somewhere in mind? And it's ends and world. Where are we going? <laughs> Nay, where are we going? Where's a place we could go in Australia and it ends in world? Sea world. Okay, there's one place. Any others? Movie world. Yeah, I've been there. That's got some cool rides. And dream world. Okay. Is anybody interested here in a new world holiday? And that doesn't mean we're going across the road to the supermarket and having a holiday from our shopping either. <laughs> this morning, the new world I'm talking about is the centre of the universe. Name heaven. You know, it's a paradise, isn't it? And the Bible, as it opens, starts with the creation of this perfect paradise. Let's all turn to Revelation chapter 21. But before we look in there, and before we turn, can we honestly trust what the Bible has to say? Amen. Amen. I found this little poem, and I want to share it with you as you're turning, about God's Word. The anvil of God's Word. Last Eve, it's talking it's back a little bit in time, so you'll have to get used to the language, and it's when they had blacksmiths. Last Eve I paused beside a blacksmith's door, and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all the hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvils wear the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's word. For ages sceptic blows have beat upon, yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unchanged and the hammer's gone by John Clifford. We can totally trust the word of God, can't we? And in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says to test everything and hold on to the good. And this morning I trust we will have the good to hold on to. Okay, as we're turning to Revelation, we were heading to 21, but because we're going to spend a little bit of time here, I think it's important just to backtrack a little bit and get the setting of Revelation. So if we turn to Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 to 3. Who is writing? Okay, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So who's writing this? John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. In verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the what is near? The time is near. Is a hint. Okay, so it's John... And scholars believe it's written in about AD 95. So if that was soon back in AD 95, now we're in 2006, do you think the coming of the Lord is nearer still? Amen. If we go to verse of Saul of chapter 1, just get a bit better context in, in verse 9 and 10. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos. So that tells us where he was. He was in Patmos. Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the spirit and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So he was obviously in vision. So that gives us a pretty good background as to the book of Revelation. So now we can go to Revelation 21 where we were originally heading. And I guess we could spend all day looking at at the descriptions and, and, and what heaven is like. But this morning I'm just going to touch on a few things. And I might jump around a little bit, but if you just bear with me and follow, you'll sure keep up. So we'll start in Revelation 21 and verse 10. Revelation 21 and verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Once again, it's highlight the fact that he was in vision. Verse 11. 
It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. Now, jasper is a quartz, and it's usually red in color. So you need, you need to use your imagination this morning. God has blessed us all with imagination, and we need to use it to the, our nth most degree, and we probably still won't grasp it, but it'll give us an idea. So we have, here we have a, 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 paint, a picture of a city, and it's from the glory of God. It's shining with the glory of God, and it's shining with a precious jewel. And remember that it's a red tinge or a red, reddish in color. Okay, reading on, verse 12. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So already we're starting to see this is actually something real, something tangible. It's not just a, a figment of the imagination. And I wonder, when you see you go to a monument, you see inscription on the stones, don't you, of, of different things that people want to inscribe. And as I was reading this, I wondered how are those names of the 12 apostles going to be etched into that rock. I guess God is a God of awesome and uncomprehendable um, things he's able to do. I wonder whether he's going to write it with his own finger or he's going to somehow embroider it on there. Because not only do we have the foundations, but we also have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel above the gates. Okay, verse 15. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure this measure. measure the city, its gates, and its walls. Gold, something that we consider extremely rare or extremely valuable. Obviously in heaven it is still of importance because they're using it to measure things, but it's something that's very common. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Are you interested yet in this all-expenses-paid holiday? The picture's starting to come together? Okay, we'll keep reading. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. Normally we read over that and just carry on. But 12,000 stadia is 2,200 kilometers. Now I did a little bit of research and that, that amount, 2,200, on one side of the city you could fit it just between New Zealand and Australia, between the closest points, and it would not be quite touching by 50 kilometres each side. So we're starting to get some dimension here. It's not just a little town. Now, the same thing as if you wanted to drive. Say you want to drive from one side of heaven to the other, driving, okay? That would be like starting at Cape Reinga, driving all the way down the North Island, right down to Wellington, and then going across on the ferry, starting again at Picton, going all the way down the coast, right down to Invercargill, and then carry on and come back up to Queenstown. And if you're driving in heaven, to do all that, you'll just be going from one side of heaven to the other. Are we starting to get some perspective? It's not little, this is huge. That's thinking on one plane, okay, it's square. Heaven is also that much high. Now that blows my mind. I, goes out of my reasoning there, but it, that's what it says. We believe what the Word of God says. So not only is it wide and that big square, but it's that high, somehow. Okay, verse 17. He measured its wall, and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. So once more converting 144 cubits, that's 65 meters thick. So that's thicker than this this whole section that the church is sitting on, the whole section, it's, it would be thick, yeah, probably close to that thick, or a lot slightly bit thicker than that. That's the wall of the city. And notice that they were using man's measurement. So obviously, maybe up in heaven, they, they have a grand scale of measuring things because things are so awesome. Okay, verse 18. The wall was made of jasper. Now we come back to what jasper was. It was that slightly red tinge. Okay, you can see through it, transparent. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure 
gold as pure as glass. Normally when you see gold, it's yellow. But apparently, if you refine it, it is totally transparent. Okay. So we have the walls which are jasper, then the city is totally transparent. Lucky we were clothed with light up there. Verse 19. Now this is the bit that I normally just race through when I'm reading this because this is the bit, but we'll, get, we'll keep working through it. Verse 19. The foundation of the city walls was decorated with every kind of precious stone. That's the foundations. The first foundation was jasper. The second sapphire. The third cladoni. The fourth emerald. The fifth sardonyx. The sixth carlean. The seventh chrysolite. The eighth beryl. The ninth topaz. The tenth Chrysophase, the eleventh Jacinth, and the twelfth Amethysts. Whew, we got through that. Now, I decided to just to check up a little bit and just try and get a, a, a mental picture of the, the colours happening here. Well, we know what sapphire is a transparent blue. Cladoni is a form of quartz with very fine crystals of greyish or blue colour. Emerald, transparent green. Sardonx, Alternate, alternating reddish brown and white with parallel bands in it. Cardanian is a reddish or yellow. Topaz, yellow and, or pink. Anthast is purple or violet. Verse 21. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. Now you... You're following so far? Keeping up? It's an amazing picture, isn't it? Now, it gets even more amazing than this if we just drop down to verse 23. Remember that everything, everything we've talked about, that it was talking about transparency, seeing through, but slightly with different slight colours going through it. Okay, you have the foundations. Verse 23. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. If we just also go over to one more, over to chapter 22, verse 5. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now, so we don't actually have a sun. We have the lamb of God which provides the light. Now, you can, what happens when you shine light at a pyramid? Does anyone know? When you shine white light at a, at a prism, sorry, at a prism, what happens? It, it splits into, divides into the colours, and what do you have? The colours of a rainbow. Rainbow colours, that's right. So you can imagine all these different coloured layers of rock. Everything's transparent, and as the light is coming from God, it is shining down. It's shining everywhere, but one of the ways light goes is down shines down to the rocks or the different layers of the foundations through these different layers of different materials or, or precious stones and the light will be what? It'll be split into prisms. So you'll have these myriads of rainbow coloured light coming not only from around you but also from out of the ground, from out of the foundations of the city. But I can guarantee you light can sometimes be overwhelming, can't it? It's too much. Well, the light, guaranteed, will not be overwhelming, will be soothing. Okay. Anyone interested yet? Oh, we're having a few amens. Okay. Is this description we've just read? Do you think someone in, in all human wisdom could have come up and dreamed up or thought of this sort of a, a concept with imagination? You can't even imagine, that's right. That's what we said, the word of God is true and trustworthy. This is places for real. Okay, verse 25 of chapter 21. Verse 25. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. Now here in New Zealand, we don't fully understand and comprehend being, out, being having to be locked up, being lock ourselves in or, or make sure everything's locked. But you talk to people from Africa, 
and they say it's a totally different story. If you're too slow at the lights, you'll get done. And at night, you have to lock yourself in because if you don't, you won't have anything left, including could be your own life. So security in heaven is the ultimate. There is no need for anything to be shut or locked. Okay, chapter 21 of verse 4, just going back a bit. He will wipe, this is talking about God, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now that's a pretty awesome promise, isn't it? But he goes further than that and he actually goes and explains why. Okay, he will, um, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Is that hope? Amen. Or mourning? Or crying? Or pain? For the old order of things has passed away. Is that hope for us? Amen. That's awesome hope. In Hebrews 10.23, it says, Hold unswervingly, or without wavering, let us hold tightly to the hope we say we have. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Do you think others around us need this hope? There's plenty of people around. There's people who, who are struggling right now with, with the hope of sickness, with lack of hope of, of sickness and, and, and in hardship. They need a hope. How well are we passing on the hope that we have? In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And it finishes off with some advice. But do this with gentleness and respect. I ask the question, are we effective witnesses? You know, it's, been, it's said that you can lead a horse to water, but you can never make it drink. But you can feed it salted peanuts. You know, just thinking, imagine if George Bush walked in here today and asked one of us or a few of us, could you be my ambassador for the US here in Wangarei? Would you want to get to know him a little bit? Would you want to know about him? Well, you know, we are ambas ambassadors, not of a president of the United States, but of the king. In fact, in Galatians 4 and verse 7, he calls us heirs. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Isn't that a privilege? Amen. You see, they say you can't tell a real Christian by their actions alone. And I know this to be true. But you can tell a real Christian, Christian by their reaction. When we have the time to think and contemplate things, we can do everything how we perceive to be right. But there's a lot of people out there who aren't Christians who do, do things right. But it's when things come up unexpected, it's by our reactions how we're, how we're viewed, isn't it? Okay, back to Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2, carrying on. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. We try and perceive what crystal clear water is, but I don't think we have any perception. Comes from the throne of God. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. You know, the Bible starts with paradise, and it only takes three chapters and where the human race has been removed from paradise. It's the rest of the Bible unfolds the plan of how to get us back to paradise. You interested yet? It'll be a peaceful place. If we go back to Isaiah chapter 65, because sometimes we, we can be taken out of context as saying everything is in the New Testament. But if we go to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 65, 
Verse 25. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. It's hard to imagine in this current day and age, isn't it? The wolf and the lamb will feed together. But you know, sometimes when we go on holiday, do we ever get bored with just doing nothing? Some of you probably don't, but I know I do. If I just go there and do something and do absolutely nothing, that lasts for about oh, three or four hours. I've got to do something, go for a walk or do something. Well, in heaven, we won't be idle. And if you stay on chapter 65 of Isaiah and go back to verse 21. In those days, people will live in their houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. So we'll be industrious. We'll be building houses and planting vineyards. You think things will be built and we have the leaky home syndrome in heaven? I don't think so. Everything will be done right. Be so peaceful. You know, all these things we've looked at are awesome reasons for wanting to go, aren't they? Are they? Oh, man, we haven't got anything close to what resembles that on, on this earth. But the best is to see Jesus. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 and 4. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. So we'll see face to face. Why is that so important, you might ask? Well, in Romans 3.23, does anyone know what that says? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That paints us a pretty good picture, doesn't it? Why it's so crucial. We'll carry on. Romans 6.23, the wages is death. That's right. We all have sinned and the wages of sin is death, so we all are due to have death. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not, but have eternal life. And John chapter 1 and verse 29, what was Jesus called? Jesus was called as he came in to see John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. So Jesus was the Lamb. Who is so... Because he was called a lamb, there had to be a sacrifice. And in Acts chapter 4, I'll just turn to that. Acts chapter 4 and verse 10 and then on to 12. You know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Isn't that awesome? Revelation 22 again, and verse 6. The angel said to me, These words are false, trustworthy and true. These are true. You know, we, we can see Christ face to face and we will live forever with our forever friend. You know, Jesus paid the price. One day at a school, there was a certain teacher, Mr. Miller, and Mr. Miller was, among other things, a Bible teacher. And this was a, a local high school, and you know how high school students are. They come there because they have to be there, and sometimes they show interests, mostly not. And Mr. Miller had been teaching these, these, this one particular class all year, and he, he felt like there was something more he had to do. He racked his brain, and he really thought hard and considered how was he going to get through to these kids and he had another couple of lessons to go and the year, year would be ended. So Mr Miller had noticed that 
in amongst all these kids, there was one particular kid that came in, Jack. Now, Jack was just like the average kid. He was keen on sport, but just used to float in and out. Sometimes he'd be there, sometimes not. Obviously, he didn't have much to do at that time of the day, so he would float in. Some of his mates used to come into the class. So anyway, Mr. Miller approached Jack and said, Jack, could you do something for me? Jack said, yeah, sure, Mr. Miller. What, what would you like me to do? He said, you're good at sport and athletics? Yes, yes, Mr. Miller, I am. Well, said Mr. Miller, can you do push-ups? Yeah, sure, I can do push-ups. How many do you do a day? Oh, I do probably 100, 150 a day, no problem. Well, said Mr. Miller, that's pretty good. Could you do something for me? Yeah, sure. I would like you to do 300 push-ups. Oh, sir, that's a bit hard. No, no, it's okay, just in sets of 10. Oh, yeah, I can work on that, said Jack. So He said, well, in, in, in about three weeks, I'll, I want you to do these as a demonstration. Yeah, no problem, said Jack. That was, he was keen, he was sort of a little bit of a nobody, but he said, yeah, I can do that, that'll be good. So anyway, a couple of weeks more went by, and um, the day arrived that Mr. Miller had referred to. The class came in and all sat down in their usual spots. Mr. Miller just sat there for a long time until there was a bit of an awkward silence in the room. Kids noticed that Mr. Miller wasn't talking. Mr. Miller slowly got up from his, from his desk at the front and said, Class, I have something different for you today. And with that, he motioned to Jack, who was standing at the back of the room, to come, come down. So Jack came up and was standing beside Mr. Miller. And with that, he, Mr. Miller walked over to the, to the very front row and on the front, the front desk, the first desk. And here was Jane. Jane was an eager student, always wanting to be at the front and wanting to learn and, and know. And he said to, to Jane, Jane, would you like something? Oh, yes, yes, please, sir, what have you got? I've got a, something for you. And with that, he turned to Jack and said, Jack, can you just reach and grab that big paper brown bag behind my, behind my desk, please? So he got this big bag and brought it over. And with that, he reached in and he pulled out a beautiful donut. Wow, the kids were going, whoa, wow, that's pretty awesome. This is pretty special for uh, getting towards the end. And he said, would you like this donut? Oh, yes, please. So he, he handed it to her. And he said, Jack, 10 push-ups. Jack rolled down on the ground, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, leapt back up to his feet. How's that, sir? That's good. Thanks, Jack. Then he moved to the next desk. And the next desk was Helen. Now, Helen, she was very conscious of the diet and sort of her eyes were, wow, this is awesome. Helen, would you, would you like a, a donut? He said as he pulled out of the bag. Helen said, oh, yes, please, sir, but I'll just keep it and, and I'll wait till, wait till I've had my lunch and then I'll eat after my lunch for dessert. That's how I need to have it. Handed her the donut. Jack, 10 push-ups, please. Jack down again, another 10. Jumped up. Come to the next, next desk, and the next one was Frank. Now, Frank was the, the, the high school person to be. He was the ducks of the school. Everyone admired Frank. He was good at sport. He was good at everything he did. He was top of the, top of the class. And as he, Mr. Miller reached into his bag and said, Frank, Frank said, it's okay, sir. I'll, I'll be happy to accept that, but I'll do my own push-ups, thanks, because he was really good at, at, at sport. And with that, he jumped up, and Mr. Miller said, Frank, sit back down on your seat. Frank said, sir, no, I can, I can do this. It's all right. It'll be fine. I can handle it. Mr. Miller said, Frank, you're in my room, and I'm the teacher. I set the rules. Sit down. So then Frank said, oh, it's okay. And still, Mr. Miller put a donut on his desk. Jack, 10 push-ups. By now, there was a real uncomfortableness in the whole room. And he moved to the next desk. It was Beth. And Beth was the reason why Frank was happened to be at the front row, because Beth was very attractive. And it was, oh, it's okay, sir. I don't need one of those. Mr. Miller pulled another donut out and stuck it on her desk. Jack, another 10 push-ups. This carried on. By now, they'd gone through the class. 
and they were at about 25. Jack was wearing. It was getting hard, but he still carried on. Nine, ten. They moved around to the next one and the next one. By now the bell had gone because the time had ticked on. There were kids coming past and, and peering in the, in the window, looking. Why are these kids still all in here? It was attracting attention. A couple of them started to, to push on the door to sort of try and hear what was happening. And the children inside, no, no, stay out. They were feeling for Jack. Mr Miller turned to Jack and said, can they come in? Yes, sir, they can come in. Three more came in, stood against the wall. By now they were to the last. Jack was on his 300th push-up, struggling with all his might. There was not a word being said, and most of the donuts were sitting on all the tables in front of the children. A few more were banging on the door, and the children were saying, Stay out, stay out. Once more, Mr. Miller asked, Can we let them come in? Yes, sir, I suppose so, said Jack. And two more came in. One by one, he went right through. And every person required Jack 10 push ups. Jack was totally exhausted. He had trained for 300 doing 30 sets of 10. But now he was at 350, pushing on for 400. His muscles didn't want to work. But he had to go on. You see, that day Mr Miller made an impact on his children, on his class. And like Mr Miller and Jack, for us today, the ticket has been purchased. Jesus is asking you and offering you much more than a donut. Some of you already know. You already know the, the awesomeness of this message that we've heard this morning. Heaven is a real thing to you. But I think it's important that we reconsider and just re, refocus on, on what it is that we're heading for and, and what's been done for us. It, be, it can become just mundane, just, just something that we know. Maybe you've never heard, never heard the message and never understood. Now's the time to consider. And if you've been considering for a long time, there are plenty of, plenty of people consider and put things off, especially children. I say to you this morning, don't wait. If you look in Revelation 22 verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. It's an offer. Jesus is inviting you. And he is coming back. Do you know when? Very soon. We never know when the end will be, do we? There's accidents and, and things happen every day. One day it might be us. We'd never know. Just the last couple of texts I want to read to you is Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Is the Lord near this morning? In Psalm 95, 7 and 8. For he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the sheep under his care. Oh, that you would listen to his voice today. And this morning I leave you with the thought that we have a ticket offered to us. All we have to do is accept and take, and take, put our name to it. It's my prayer this morning that we would take it and put our name to it. Because it is my prayer that when we do get to heaven, I will see every one of you there. Amen. That is my prayer this morning.